eh, con el gran historiador Jonathan Hodge, que nos haga una presentación del de doctor Sicor. Adelante, Juan Manuel, por favor. Muchas gracias, eh, doctora Barahona, por, por, la, por la posibilidad de presentar al profesor James Seacord. El profesor Seacord, eh, como ya se mencionaba, eh, trabaja o trabajaba hasta muy recientemente, se acaba de retirar en el Departamento de Historia y Filosofía de la Universidad de Cambridge, de la cual fue director ya en, en, en varias ocasiones. Eh, actualmente es profesor emérito de la, de la universidad y eh, es el director del de proyecto de la correspondencia de Darwin, uno de los proyectos eh, más importantes que hay alrededor de la, de la obra de Darwin, que justamente el día de hoy han anunciado que nos van a liberar toda la información de las cartas disponibles que hay en los archivos gracias a este proyecto que lleva ya muchos años y del cual el profesor Sicord es su director. Eh, además, por mencionar solamente, eh, el profesor Sicord es un gran especialista en temas de historia social de la ciencia, así como de cuestiones relacionadas con la historia de las ciencias de la vida y las ciencias de la tierra, y muy especialmente el interés que ha mostrado a través de varias de sus publicaciones a lo largo de los años sobre la historia de la comunicación de la ciencia, particularmente las publicaciones victorianas como los vestigios de la historia natural de la creación y el propio origen de las especies del cual pues hoy nos va a dar esta presentación tan interesante. Uh, Jim, please, the space is yours. Okay, well, first of all, let me thank everyone for this wonderful invitation to speak to um, my friends in Mexico. Um, I had a fantastic trip um, several years ago Um, with the Inhigio group, and um, very much hope to come back to Mexico, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, so if we can have the first slide, please. Okay, and then if we go to the next slide, that would be great. So, It may seem perverse to juxtapose the name of Darwin with the history of paper manufacture. The Darwin name has been associated with abstract evolutionary speculation on the grandest scale, as shown by this um, picture, which was used in Britain as the um, icon of the celebrations in 2009. And on the other hand, the story of paper belongs to the mundane, stinking world of industrial technology. What I want to do today in celebrating Darwin's birthday is to argue that these histories, the history of Darwin in the broadest sense and the history of paper should be brought together. My reasons for taking this practical tack grow out of a longstanding desire to construct large scale narratives about science that go beyond specific case studies, however fascinating these may be. A traditional way of writing such narratives has been to focus on the publication of big ideas, such as the rise of evolutionary thinking. In this respect, the Darwinian revolution, which was invented in the late 19th century as an episode in the history of the human mind, remains a staple of intellectual history. An alternative has been to focus on practical activities of collecting classification, experiment, and display, particularly in relationship to the growth of, em of empire and the nation state in the 19th century. Other historians take their key from philosophy and have focused on epistemological issues. Now, all of these approaches have been fruitful, but they have often left subjects in which theoretical synthesis um, played an important role, as in the history of evolution, in a conceptual cul-de-sac outside the mainstream of historiographical stresses on practice and materiality. So what I want to do in thinking about Darwin on this day is to take a different tack. Some years ago, I was invited to a meeting on worlds of paper at the Linnaean Society in London. As it happened, I was the only speaker on the period after 1790. And so I was led to wonder how the history of evolutionary science in Britain over more than two centuries might be covered in less than 20 minutes. The conference's focus on paper and my own preference for a history grounded in practices and material life 
suggested a different story. Next slide, please. My inspiration comes from William Cronin's Nature's Metropolis, Chicago and the Great West, an environmental history which shows not only how images of Chicago and the surrounding reason, region were transformed by the circulation of print, advertising, tourist guidebooks, and so forth, but also how this was made possible by the creation of large scale, clear cut logging in the forests of Northern Wisconsin and Michigan. That's where the paper for these propaganda um, for tourism came. Although acknowledged as one of the founding classics of environmental history, Cronin's work has had less impact in intellectual history than might have been anticipated. My other source of inspiration has been recent work on the gendered nature of paper, particularly the collection Working With Paper. As the editors have stressed, a focus on the uses of this key commodity port, points toward, as they say, a history of knowledge that uniquely enfolds material histories with the gendered worlds that made them. I hope to combine these approaches to recast what is often known as the Darwinian revolution as an episode in the circulation of material goods. My argument thus has two starting points. The first is to consider Darwin not as the single person who we think about on the 24th of November, and even less as the heroic genius struck by lightning, but instead as part of a family that has a significant part to play in the history of theorizing about species throughout the long 19th and through most of the 20th century. The notion of family, both literal and metaphorical, is one of the ways that we might rethink issues of intellectual genealogy in a more practical way. It's the first step in writing a history in which authorship is consistently understood in relationship to the material circumstances of a rapidly shifting industrial economy. In that sense, my talk very much builds on what Janet Brown was saying just earlier this week. My second starting point involves a key resource for the Darwin family's intellectual legacy, paper. Paper is often seen as passive until something is done to it. But paper itself embodies a highly dynamic relationship between plants and people. From the late 18th century through the early 20th century, paper was transformed from a handmade luxury to a factory commodity produced in vast quantities. Cheap paper became one of the key technologies of the industrial revolution, particularly involved in transport and especially in communication. It was one of a number of developments that facilitated the rise of cheap newspapers, inexpensive periodicals, and books affordable by working and lower middle class readers. These changes were vital to the conduct of intellectual debates. A key issue in considering them is genre, a category which combines the material aspects of its work at the most basic paper with questions of style, marketing, and readership. The fashion of elite that enjoyed large quarto volumes and folios in the late 18th century expected wide margins and attractive copper print plate illustrations, just as those who read polemical evolutionary tracts a century later expected inexpensive wrappers, pages crowded with type, and a bargain price. The most problematic task carried out over many decades was in determining an appropriate format for speculation about the origins of species and humans. A focus on paper identifies books and other forms of print first and foremost as material commodities derived from the living and non-living world. In this sense, the circulation of printed paper is closely akin to the history of food, medicines, and other globally circulated goods. As the Victorians like to say, reading is like eating, but only if eating is properly understood as a complex act involving high degrees of interpretation and sensory discrimination. The particular forms of intellectual life characteristic of Europe and especially Britain were highly innovative in developing new ways of consuming paper. In a very literal way, intellectual debate was closely bound up with these changes. 
I'll conclude my talk today by reflecting on the larger implications of this story, especially how approaches drawn from environmental and gender history might help in dealing with long historical periods. So let's start by looking at three books authored by different generations of men within the Darwin family. Next slide, please. The first is Erasmus Darwin's Zoonomia, or The Laws of Organic Life. The second is Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. And the third is Leonard Darwin's Need for Eugenic Reform. Rather than starting out from the role of these books in the history of theorizing about species and origins, I want, first of all, to think what they are made of. My friend, John Plunkett of the University of Exeter, told me some years ago that in his course on book history, he turns out the light and gives students books to handle in darkness. I hope he gives them cheap ones. What is the experience of touching, feeling, and smelling these Darwinian books? As part of the fascination with technical progress in the Botanic Garden, Erasmus noted, Darwin noted how the terms applied to modern books reflected the different parts of the papyrus plant, even though books in Europe were now produced from cotton rags. The leaf of this plant, he says, was first used for paper, hence the word paper, and leaf or folium for the fold of a book. Afterwards, the bark of a species of mulberry used, where liber signifies a book and the bark of a tree. The various editions of Zoonomia are recycled rags from hemp and flax. Through a complex network of rag and bone men, women sorters, rag merchants, and paper manufacturers, old clothing and linen were gathered and reduced to a pulp, which was then made, as you can see in the next slide, sheet by sheet into high quality paper. So if we could go to the next slide, please. This one? Yeah, that's it. Yes. This shows the process of making paper by hand, sheet by sheet. It's from the Encyclopédie in mid 18th century France. Not surprisingly, this was one of the many factors that made books expensive. The first edition of Zoonomia was advertising at retailing for no less than three guineas, that's three pounds and three shillings in two volumes in a large quarto volume version. It was sold in cheap card boards, which would be then replaced by purchasers who would send their copies out for binding in leather. It has wide margins, fine copper plate engravings, and nicely spaced type in a format intended to match Erasmus Darwin's other works, as well as large scale philosophical and literary books. All this fits well with the intended market. Next. Next slide. Zoonomia was a work of medical theory addressed to physicians and learned natural philosophers and issued by John Johnson of London, the publishers of a number of books by radicals such as Joseph Priestley during the French Revolution. It began by attacking mechanical theories of the animate world, arguing again instead that life may have begun from one living filament, developing through its own actions and passing these changes through subsequent generations. The second volume offered a classification of disease. Later editions appeared in four cheaper, but still attractive quarto volumes. So let's look at the next book. On the Origin of Species also comes from primarily ragstock, although by this time it is less likely to come from linen and more likely to be made from cotton cloth, which was derived from clothes, which ultimately would have been made from cotton from plantations made by enslaved people in the southern United States. And esparto grass and wood pulp were coming into use by this point, but not for any quality productions. The big change here is that the paper has been manufactured by machine rather than by hand. Let's go to the next slide. Known as the Ford Vrindier machine after the London stationers who financed its introduction into Britain, this is one of the largest machines of the Industrial Revolution. The new technology was quickly taken up so that machine made paper became the norm in Europe during the first half of the 19th century. In its paper, as in many other ways, the origin of species is a transitional object 
poised between artisanal and machine production. It is largely made from rags, but these have been put together by machine. Next slide. The transitional nature of the origin is also apparent in its binding. The green cloth is mechanically woven, but like the paper itself, the cotton which it is made is hand picked by enslaved people in the American South. And the design impressed in the covers and the title in gold um, have been done by hand. The paper has been cold pressed between glazed boards so as to take a fine impression from a steam powered press. But the signatures are folded and sewn by hand by women. In the printing house, this process was highly gendered. Man, men ran the machines and carried out the heavier handwork. Women did the lighter work, especially the folding and sewing of signatures. With this kind of cloth cased case binding, a book could be put directly on the shelf or replaced for rebinding. In fact, many copies of the origin were immediately rebound, especially for the commercial circulating libraries. Among its readerships too, the origin was a transitional work. At one level, it targeted a genteel literate audience interested in what the sciences had to say about natural history. In the other, it named to convince new specialists in the natural history sciences that a theory of descent need not lead to boundless speculation, but could be approached via the more tractable problem of explaining the existence of varieties and species. For both of these overlapping markets, the more popular readers and the more specialist scientific ones, paper quality mattered, as did production values more generally. They were a significant part of the way the book addressed its readers. The key intermediary in ensuring a measured reception was the publisher, John Murray of Albemarle Street. His imprint was associated with genteel respectability. So let's look at our third book. The next slide, please. The Need for Eugenic Reform, published by Murray in 1926, was written by Charles Darwin's son, Leonard, in his role as president of the Eugenic Society. Next slide. This book is printed on quality, chemically treated wood pulp paper, almost certainly foreign made and imported, and produced much more extensively by machine than the origin. The book offered a thorough survey of evolution and genetics with a stress on its supposed applications for population control. It identified a series of racial poisons, advocating avoidance of alcohol, sexually tra transmitted diseases, and marriage between what were presented as inferior and superior races. The book, as you can see on the right here, was dedicated to Charles Darwin in belief that the text was making his life's work of service to mankind. The physical appearance of the book combine, combined with the Murray imprint located the work within conventions of publication for academically credible works that were by this time well established. The origin had in fact played a critical role in this, codifying the format for reflective work of original synthesis on these kind of topics. The need for eugenic reform had all the serious, the marks of a serious contribution to knowledge. Um, and in this sense, it's like it's slightly later successor. Next slide. Ronald Fisher's Gen Genetical Theory of Natural Selection published by the Clarendon Press at Oxford in 1930. This eugenic text, both a key contribution to mathematical evolutionary and the campaign of eugenics that Leonard Darwin had supported, appeared in a generally similar format and in a similar quality of paper. Fisher now de dedicated his book to Leonard Darwin, thus placing it in a direct line of Darwinian succession. Next slide. The need for eugenic reform also provided the basis for a tract of 1928, What is Eugenics? If his larger work appeared as an academic treatise, the paper, price, and production values of this one marked it out for a popular market. Unlike the larger work and the origin, this text was stereotyped from the present, making it possible to reproduce new printings without the substantial cost of resetting type. As the abruptly questioning title suggests, the readership was different too. 
before the book appeared under the imprint of the free thinking rationalist pub publisher, Watson Company, known by its opponents as the blasphemy devil. It was cheap and intended to raise debates among middle class and working class readers. Issued both in hardback with the dust jacket and in expensive paper covers, the book argued, argued for population control through a combination of moral restraint and government legislation. Now, the story of these three generations of Darwinian books is in many ways a familiar one, almost too familiar. By the early 20th century, books were much more thoroughly manufactured objects than they had been, and they had the potential to meet much larger audiences. But I think it's a story that is easily forgotten, and certainly one that has had little attention other than from paper conservators. The material history of paper is most revealing in providing an aggregate view of print, especially when seen in combination with other technological changes I've already mentioned, stereotyping, for example, and the associated expansion of literacy, leadership, and distribution. The result was a transformation in the availability of printed materials, greater than, and at least as complex, as, it, as the changes associated with the introduction of the printing press and movable type in the Renaissance. Now, considering such famous books as I've been talking about so far as paper, you might even call it de-inking to borrow a phrase from modern paper recycling, certainly has its limits. From an economic perspective, it highlights only one factor in a cluster of issues that transformed the publishing industry, ranging from mechanical typesetting to the increasing role of international copyright. In that sense, paper is just a symbolic indicator, although a significant one, of a cluster of changes. Moreover, taken in isolation, a focus on paper makes possible only the most general statements about the contents of specific works. I have talked about content, but if you were looking at them simply in terms of the paper they were printed on, you mainly would be able to say things about audience and cost. But understood in a broader context of practices of reading, authorship, and publication, paper and associated issues with production could be significant at every level. The topography of literary form shifted over time in response to a wide range of factors. Publishers and authors had to make choices. Authors for gentlemen's libraries in the 18th century, like Erasmus Darwin, were particularly aware of production values. One of the key advertised differences between the different editions of Erasmus Darwin's Zoonomia had been the sheer volume of paper on display in turning the pages. The quarto size had large margins characteristic of such productions to display a generous expanse of blank paper. By the early 20th century, the appearance of, of a book in this luxury format had become self-consciously anachronistic, recalling the glories of 18th century publishing. Next slide. For example, this not very good copy of Henry Knipe's Nebulae to Man, um, published in London in 1905, revived not only the verse form used by Erasmus Darwin, but also the fine printing quarto format and appearance of high quality paper that had characterized his books. However, by his own admission, Knipe's science involved tertiary popularization rather than the original theorizing that Erasmus Darwin had engaged in. And the paper, however attractive it was in 1905, is now obviously made from wood pulp rather than rag stock. Marketed for bibliophiles in the gift market from nebulae to man contrasted with the bulk of early 20th century Darwinian publication. We can get some idea of the increasingly clear distinctions within scientific publishing genres by looking at the most famous and prolific author of the Darwin family. Few men of science in the early industrial era of print were more sensitive to printing and publishing than Charles Darwin, who employed many different types of writing during his long and productive career as an author. His works covered a wide range, notably specialist articles in monthly and quarterly scientific periodicals. The Zoology of the Beagle, next slide, appeared as an expensive multi-volume quarto part work, here you can see one of the parts, with colored plates issued to subscribers 
The Voyages Geology was also published in parts, although then in this case is a more modest octavo. Particularly in his later life, Darwin also published tactically in the newspapers and especially in weekly journals devoted to intellectual exchange, such as the Gardener's Chronicle for Nature. The science of geology shaped not only Darwin's early intellectual orientation, but also the way in which he thought about his scientific readerships and how to place works effectively with the right publishers offering the right quality of production. Here, the most significant issues were continuity and reputation, quality of reproduction, and the ability to avoid mistakes. Navigating the options when the categories of scientific periodicals, monographs, and textbooks was very much fluid, required considerable skill, but was largely mediated by the choice of publisher. Darwin certainly knew this. The paper to be used was fundamental. And interestingly, on several occasions, Darwin directly intervenes to specify the cost and quality to be used. For example, negotiating for his book on the geology of South America, Darwin was clear in his demands. I should like the paper, he said, to be of the same price as before. Has not the quality improved of late for the same price? With a publisher like Murray, generally, Darwin was able to assume that the paper would be suitable for purpose. And in fact, during the 19th century, concerns about the specific qualities of paper are rarely voiced directly by scientific authors, other than when works were limited editions or required specific qualities for illustration or for use in the field or library. Instead, the focus was increasingly on the author as the provider of the text, with physical production controlled by publishers and printers. Paper, in this sense, became naturalized as a neutral space ready for printing. The subtle distinctions involved in making that possible, carried out, for example, by the women who sorted rags, the workers who tended the machines, and the commercial men at the printers who negotiated prices, these were people where the real decisions about paper and quality were often being made. This broad division of labor in terms of choice of material was mediated by genre. And it is not surprising that generic boundaries became much sharper from the middle of the 19th century onwards. Genre is particularly useful here because it inextricably unites the physical and textual qualities of a work to a tacit agreement between producers, authors, and readers. Navigating the range of publishing options for a speculative theory of species origins was in fact a particularly difficult problem. As Darwin considered various forms of publications for his theories, the question of respectability became paramount. His initial plan, next slide, embodied in his essay of 1844, would have involved a short book of about between 200 and 300 pages. Once Darwin began writing up his theory again in earnest in the early 1850s, he planned, as Janet's discussed, something much more like a multi-volume monograph that would have been accessible primarily to specialists. The untimely intervention of Alfred Russell Wallace in 1858, which Wallace had initially intended for rapid publication in a commercial science journal, changed all that. Darwin then began thinking about a series of essays in a scientific periodical published by one of the scientific societies in London, then back to a short treatise, and finally that abstract of an essay that was the first edition of The Origin. Next slide, please. As Darwin told his publisher, John Murray, on seeing the first copy, I am infinitely pleased and proud at the appearance of my child. Interestingly, a decade later, Darwin was less satisfied, particularly after the publication of The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication in two handsome volumes in 1868. As he told Murray, some members of my family have remarked that the old origin of species has a very poor appearance compared with my domestic animals. And I do think this is due to the quality of the paper. So I hope you will attend to this point for the present work, The Descent of Man. It is significant that Darwin expressed this, not as his own view, but that of more general readers, 
perhaps because it was this sort of aesthetic question in which a scientific man like himself was not generally expected to take an interest. In any event, Murray upgraded his expenditure, not only for the paper of descent, but origin as well, both being printed on Crown Dickinson, rather than a somewhat cheaper product from Spalding and Hodge. Such issues were particularly important for the descent, which as both Murray and Darwin knew, and as Gawain Dawson has shown, face particular problems in terms of appearing respectable and scientific. As Darwin wrote to Murray's assistant a few years later, when the question of a cheap edition was of, of dissent was being mooted, I should certainly be glad, Darwin said, to have the dissent cheaper and sold more largely, but I should be sorry to be, see it printed like the origin. A surprising number of persons have told me that the origin is intolerable in its present state. They say also that it looks shabby, but I do not so much care about that. Several persons have told me that they cannot and will not even try to read the present edition of The Origin. My wife, for one, says it is intolerable. My wife has just come in to protest against making the book horrible, but cheapness is a most important advantage. I'm utterly puzzled and do not know what to think. Next slide. Now, by the time that Darwin wrote this letter in 1874, the origin had undergone a fundamental physical transformation from all of the earlier editions. These did make it considerably less attractive than it had been in 1859. And you can see that very clearly from the page shown here. Darwin had been forthright in arguing for a cheap edition. He was extremely anxious, he said, for the origin to reach as wide an audience as possible, although this meant thinner paper and a smaller typeface. The aim was to make the final sixth edition of 1872, shown here, what was often called in the trade a people's edition, targeted a much wider range of readers and the more general public debate. Even at a price of six shillings, Darwin thought, would put it out of reach. He was, however, pro profoundly disappointed that even with all these reduced production values, the sixth edition was priced at seven shillings and sixpence. The book looked horrible, as Emma Darwin said, but with a price that remained fundamentally targeted at the same market as the original. As the 19th century came to a close and the 42 year copyright period of the first edition was running out, Murray began to make the book cheaper. Initially, he produced 7,000 copies of a less expensive hardback edition and two shillings and sixpence in 1900. It included a nice portrait of Darwin and most of the copies sold out almost immediately. Next slide. But it was only after, after Alfred Helm, Harmsworth, publisher of the Daily Mail, another cheap reading for the working and lower middle classes, threatened a really inexpensive edition that Murray made the book available at a truly budget price of one shilling. Next slide. In many ways, this ugly but inexpensive paperback of 1901 with its flimsy green card covers is the most significant in the entire evolutionary canon of the long 19th century. For it is only around this date, not in 1859 or in 1872, when Darwin's complex and sophisticated arguments finally appeared at full length in a form cheap enough to be bought by those below the professional and upper middle classes. The Descent of Man was issued at the same time at the bargain price for such a large book of two shillings and sixpence. Next slide, please. The paperback origin has been largely ignored by historians, but its significance is, I think, incalculable. More copies of the book sold in Britain between November 1901 and November 1902 than in the entire 19th century. The numbers are striking. 56,000 copies of origin had been sold in Britain until November 1901. In the eight months after that date, Murray alone sold over 45,000 copies. It's only 10,000 less from Murray alone. And there were also large editions from two other publishers, Wardlock, who was a middle brow publishers, whose motto was full steam ahead, 
and in the so-called World's Classic series by Grant Richards. Darwin's sons, Francis, George, and William, who were handling relations with Murray, were astounded by the success of the Schilling edition. Not least, the appearance of this book changes our chronology of the understanding of Darwinism, for it suggests that only after the turn of the century that evolutionary discussion became fully embedded in the emerging culture of mass communication in Britain and the settler colonies of the British Empire. It places the chronology of the Darwinian movement in a new relationship to that in other countries, for it is also after 1900 that the book substantially broadened its already global circulation. The first Arabic translation, for example, appeared in 1919, the first Chinese one in 1920. In Europe and America, by 1901, books were far more characteristically factory products than they had been in 1859, when books such as The Origin still, as we've seen, embodied substantial handwork in their typesetting, binding, and printing. The cheapening of paper was especially significant. This is clear from the available statistics. In 1832, Charles Babbage estimated that the paper, not including tariffs and taxes, contributed just over a third to the overall cost of the manufacture of a book. By the early 20th century, that figure was more typically around six or 7%. Such savings could have a substantial effects. And more, more than that, the number of workers involved in the paper industries, as one historian commented at the time, was a respectable figure, occupying some 5% of the national labor force Statistics are hard to find, but it is clear by the end of the 19th century, about half of the paper produced was used for packaging and about half for printing, especially newspapers. Given the cost of paper before wood pulp was so largely used, earlier percentages would have been dominated by printing rather than packaging. When the origin finally became affordable by a mass readership in Britain through editions like this at the opening of the 20th century, Darwin was, of course, long dead. Yet it is clear that he would have welcomed the belated appearance of his work in a cheap form. Throughout his life, comments in his letters indicate his interest in the physical qualities of his books and their relationship to the market. On a few occasions, he complained of the tendency to publishers to release their books with uncut pages. He recalled the conservatism of paper manufacturers who had complained in 1840 to the prime minister that introducing the cheap penny post would lead to a decline in the demand for paper as correspondence was used in expensive note paper rather than quality letter sheets. They, of course, had been proved wrong about that, and Darwin thought they would be proved wrong in asking readers to work with a paper knife in hand. He even noted that cut pages would be a great boon to children who are forced by their elders to cut through dry and pictureless books before they could be read. The North Americans, he said, have set us the example of cutting and often gilding the edges. What can be the reason that the same plan is not followed here in Britain? Is it mere Toryism? In sounding this political note, Darwin drew on the association of his family name with liberalism, progress, and independence of thought. Charles Darwin stressed in the life of his grandfather that Erasmus was what would now be called a liberal or perhaps a radical. The Darwins maintained also in religion, a family tradition of free thought, rejecting divine revelation, next slide, but accepting the likely existence of a deity. Darwinizing was a word invented by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1815, and it was intended to call up images of uncontrolled speculation. It referred, of course, not to Charles Darwin, who was only six years old at the time, but to his grandfather Erasmus. For the Darwins, certainly for Charles and his children and grandchildren, it became a family inheritance. From the 1820s, Charles Darwin owned a copy of Zoonomia. Next slide, please. And as you can see here, he opened his first species notebook, the bee notebook, in the 1830s with the phrase Zoonomia. Ever since Noel Annan's celebrated article on the intellectual aristocracy, Historians have been familiar with the way in which a small number of families emerged during the 19th century as leaders of cultural life in Britain. 
The Darwins were among those who shaped this role, both in forging it as a construct and through their own continuing example. The family was acutely aware of its place in history and worked hard to preserve it by publishing extracts from what was by, even by the 1860s, a substantial family archive. This meant writing books about the Wedgwoods and Darwins, sometimes for public publication, sometimes for private use. Darwin himself used these archives to write a biographical account of his grandfather. This concern with family history is carried out through the 20th century through books like Henrietta Litchfield's Emma Darwin, A Century of Family Letters in 1915, Gwen Ravarat's evocative period piece in 1852, Next slide, please. And Randall Kane's movings. Sorry, go to the next slide after that. Um, and Randall Kane's moving Annie's box in 2001. The sense of a family inheritance remains very strong today. There's something flattering about considering the Darwins as belonging to an, a scientific aristocracy, but in many ways, Annan's term is not quite right for the family clearly belonged to the professional middle classes. A more useful right model for thinking about them rather than intellectual aristocracy is, to, is provided by Lenore Davidoff and Catherine Hall's Family Fortunes. Next slide, please. Which describes the way in which many early 19th century businesses relied on middle-class domestic structures and work patterns that cross gender divides. Most intellectual production, certainly in Western Europe, relied on loose ties of affiliation and recruitment that made questions of family highly significant. Emma, for example, regularly served as a sounding board and arbiter of taste while organizing an extensive domestic regime. Darwin's eldest daughter, Henrietta, did so much editorial work on the descent of man that her father termed her his very dear good adjutor and fellow laborer. The family, of course, has continued to re can encourage research in the Darwin archive. The Darwin family had formulated its identity in the late 18th and early 19th century around medicine. Erasmus was a doctor and his son Robert was one of the most successful physicians in the Midlands. Robert sent both his son, Erasmus Alvey Darwin and Charles Darwin to Edinburgh to learn medicine. And Charles, in turn, made sure that all his sons had professions, although besides medicine, their training ranged in engineering, banking, and law. Francis Darwin, who trained in medicine, but used his knowledge to pursue physiological botany at Cambridge, was identified as the one who would carry on the family tradition in natural history. Not only did he compile his father's biography, but he collaborated directly on the power of movement in plants and the expression of emotions. In certain ways, of course, the history of the Darwins is most unusual, the my note means unique, in the history of modern intellectual life. In earlier centuries, families did establish dynasties lasting several generations, as the scientific um, generations of Carl Linnaeus and George Cuvier, um, certainly what they hoped to do particularly from the mid 19th century onwards with the ideals of family were transferred into the scientific research school. The masters of such schools were often spoke of as beloved fathers who ran their laboratories or museums like a family. The Darwin sons accomplished this on a characteristically large scale in the academic setting here in Cambridge from where I'm speaking with the physicist George, the botanist Francis and the instrument maker Horace all engaged in recruiting succeeding generations to their respective scientific fields. After Leonard Darwin congratulated the eugenicist Ronald Fisher on his election to the Royal Society in 1929, Fisher replied, I knew you would be glad and your pleasure is as good to me almost as though my own father were still living. There was very much a sense that the family inheritance of evolutionary theorizing was now being passed into the realms of university and research institutes. At the same time, of course, in the case of the Darwins, it continued within the family as well. So just a few words in conclusion. The history of cultural life 
has often had rather little to do with environmental history and in many ways is seen as antithetical to it, as indeed my first slide showed. There are understandable concerns about reduction and technological determinism, making ideas an epic phenomena of technological or biological change. Yet in dealing with large scale changes over very long periods, culture and nature must surely be seen together. Genealogies of families and of literary production are clearly important elements in this. A focus on paper offers a much needed opportunity to recast the gender dynamics of what has traditionally been considered as the special domain of intellectual history. Next slide. The two interrelated themes developed in this essay can be both expressed as lines. One of these shown here is the Darwin family tree, which primarily through its male line maps a more general history of evolutionary speculation. In this case, we can see a family emerge from a country background in the traditional professions toward exploitations of the possibility of com the commerce and state action associated with the new science laboratories and universities of the later 19th century. The other, next slide please, is a line from economic statistics of technological innovation and production, which among other changes, led paper from being expensive and handmade to cheap and being produced by machine. Both lines are effectively complex and branching, expressing subtle and sometimes not so subtle hierarchies of race, class, and gender relations. Viewed in this way, both the literal connotations of genealogy and the linear rise of paper productions have strong connections with environmental history. The family is generations of Darwin's, and not only eugenicists such as Leonard attempted to argue, is a construct both simultaneously biological and historical. Family is also recurring themes in the most familiar sorts of intellectual history, whether in the literal form of inheritance of the kind advocated by Francis Galton, or in more abstract forms of scholarly discipleship and intellectual genealogy. As when, as I said, Ronald Fisher identified Leonard Darwin as akin to his father. Here, as in so many other instances, as Erasmus Darwin wrote with usual prescience in the preface to Zoonomia, the whole is one family of one parent. Taking the longest view, intellectual production since the emergence of the Codex in the eighth century can be expressed as the remains of successive forms of engagement with the plants and animals of the living world. In a medieval library, we are surrounded by the remains of dead sheep. In a collection of early modern books, we are in a world of old clothes made from hemp, cotton, and flax. In the great libraries of the later 19th, and early 20th century, we are often wandering through the vestiges of lost old growth forests. The story of intellectual life is embodied in these differences. In 1800, the adjective to Darwinize conjured up images of erotic abandon in the elite context of salon culture, genteel learned conversation, and elite bibliophilia. A century later, in 1900, to Darwinize or Darwinian had become an everyday staple of mass new newspaper journalism and the biological basis for society itself from colonial wars to the latest fashion. This redefinition of Darwinism as a global intellectual movement depended absolutely on cheap paper, cheap printing and cheap distribution. So I would argue that the most significant connection between Darwinism and economics is not between natural selection and the writings of Thomas Malthus, as important as the link for that was for Charles Darwin in discovering natural selection. Rather, it is more about basic issues of economic exchange and trade underpinned by faith in the progress of industrial civilization. As Peter Bowler has stressed, natural selection was surprisingly marginal to the acceptance of Darwinism by most readers, particularly in the last few decades of the 19th century. Even for Darwin himself, it was the bigger issues of evolutionary progress 
that mattered most. Under the banner of science, Darwinism was seen to unite industrial advance, free trade, and imperial conquest. And for all of these, the rise of global communications was absolutely central. In an era dominated by mass marketing, economic expansion, and racial division, Darwinism became a label, a way of selling diverse public audiences a range of intellectual positions and complex arguments relating to the perceived advance of European civilization. As Jim Moore suggested, Darwinism came into being around the same time as a host of other isms, including communism, capitalism, agnosticism, and many others. Like these other isms, Darwinism was a form of advertisement, in effect, a brand. For publishers and editors in the proliferating press of the late 19th and early 20th century, there were opportunities for maintaining readerships eager to follow ongoing intellectual debates and for identifying adherents to particular political, religious, and ideological stances. Advocacy of Darwinism was associated with what it meant to be scientific, rational, competitive, and progressive, the epitome of what it meant to be modern. Next slide. Considered from the broadest perspective, what is often termed the Darwinian revolution can be thought of as a story of the global circulation of raw materials from the great forests in Northern Europe, America, and Southern Australia to paper mills and printing established in urban centers to be shipped by post, rail, and ship to reading audiences throughout the world. In terms of gross output, the number of trees cut down to supply the paper for intellectual controversy of any kind, let alone that relating to the sciences, was obviously relatively insignificant. But the effect on the debates themselves of cheap paper, machine printing, and new readerships was incalculable, as authors, editors, and publishers fully recognized. More than that, the unparalleled range and availability of evolutionary build, uh, views helped to underwrite an understanding that civilization was about progress and that nature was for use. Evolution was one of the attitudes that contributed to the idea that old growth forests could be, and perhaps should be, logged as part of the development of civilization. Viewed from the perspective I've tried to develop, intellectual debate was among the more esoteric byproducts of new forms of print journalism and popular publishing for new illiterate, new literate readerships among the middle and working classes. Most fundamentally, it was an important way of using at least a fraction of those hundreds of thousands of tons of wood pulp paper. If there's to be an environmental history of cultural life, this is one place to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for this wonderful talk. Uh, now we're uh, just waiting for some uh, questions about this lovely lecture. Uh, lovely. In the meantime, I have a question for you, as we are just waiting for the rest of yeah. the people for some uh, questions. Uh, I'm just wondering, I know that today is the origin of a species day and is made the best known book of Darwin. But I just want to ask you, if we, if you, in this case, if you want to look for some other of Darwin's books, which one do you think that maybe is uh, not really being understood, maybe because of his, uh, of its um, scientific content, and maybe which which of the other Darwin book is maybe under under underestimated? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, that it, it partly depends on what perspective you're coming from. I mean, one thing I've certainly learned from the Darwin correspondence is that Darwin's very late botanical works on the movement of plants and so forth are much more up to date and much more involved in contemporary. Um, German especially, attitudes toward experimentation and cell theory and other sorts of things than I think most people have realized. So there's quite a lot of sophistication there that hasn't been appreciated. 
In terms of public perception, I think the book that people have changed their views about most in the last 10 years or so is The Descent of Man, I think, which I think does play a very crucial role, both within Darwin's own work, but also I think in terms of the way that Darwin was accepted in many different countries throughout the world. Um, certainly when I first started studying Darwin, The Descent of Man was really looked down on in many ways as being rather, a, you know, uh, it, it's got about well, the sources weren't seen to be very good. It was, seemed to be just, you know, like Darwin would look at his dogs and they'd seem very friendly. So he'd write about how dogs could be friendly. And that was like a human emotion. I think people have realized that it's much more sophisticated than that. And that um, there's a lot going on in the work, which is, is really mm -hmm. significant. I mean, one thing I should say also is that I've really, I mean, in some ways, this talk is about a very small handful of books, both by Darwin you know, but other people. In many ways, if you're really writing about Darwinism and the history of paper, the real place to focus on probably is are the journals and the newspapers. And that's an area of work that I don't think has been properly studied. We still look back to Elgar's um, Darwin and the General Leader for much of that, and that was published in what, 1958 or 59. So there's a kind of way in which I think that whole story about the, the way in which those journals are actually producing this kind of discussion, I think is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Anna, there, you want to say something? There are some comments on the chat. Are you uh, available to, to see them? Yeah, I can. I think I can get them up here. Yeah. I, I, oh, well, Louis. Hello, Louis. Louis. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, I think they just congratulate me so far. Let's just see. Yeah, there's there's only congratulate. I'm I'm very happy to be congratulated. It's I should say, um, for me, this is quite an experimental sort of paper. I I I grew up during the middle of the environmental movement of the, around 1970. And so I've always been very interested in environmental history. Mm -hmm. And I think trying to relate it to intellectual history is a, a, in, in quite a direct way. And people often say books are material objects. And that really matters, but then that also offer um, opportunities for thinking about them in, in more direct and material kinds of ways. And so it's, I think it's quite an interesting opportunity to try to do that. So that's really what the, the paper is, is about. Um, I'm working with chemists currently to make sure that I really am right in saying the books are made from wood and linen and so forth. I'm pretty sure about that, but, but um, you know, there's people at the, um, National Chemical Laboratories who can do more specific analyses. So I think it's a kind of research that's quite um, material and helpful, I think, with this. Yeah. I have a question, but it's not related to the to the paper um, industry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a, uh, in one of, of your slides, you showed the first uh, page of the introduction. <coughs> of the book on the origin of species. Mm -hmm. And it says, my work is now nearly finished, but as it will it take me many more years to complete it, and as my health is far from strong, I have been urged to publish this abstract. Yes. So how long it was, it was going to be if, uh, if they published the whole, the whole material? Yeah. I ask you because uh, few people know about this. So yeah. it's very interesting to see how Darwin thought of his work on a large scale, and then it was urged and Harry to, to publish something. Yeah, I, I think the quick answer to that is that um, it probably would have, it would have taken Darwin several more years, probably till the mid 1860s or so. And my guess would be that he was thinking a book that was about as long as the first edition of Lyle's Principles of Geology. In other words, a sort of three volume substantial work. So at least twice, maybe three times as long as The Origin of Species. To be honest, I think the thing we have most to thank Alfred Russell Wallace for is that he got him to make the book much shorter. And I think he also, um, there was a kind, there's a kind of way, I think Janet may have talked about this in, in her book. There's a way in which Darwin was slogging away on all this material and the way that his drafts read from that time, which were published, you know, much later, 
um, by, by Robert Stauffer as a separate book, are quite dull. There's not really much excitement in them. And I think what happened when Wallace's letter came is that it, it, it put fire underneath Darwin. And so he was then wanted to really reach a broader audience and he got quite excited about what he was doing. So, so I think that, um, and that comes across in at least some of the writing in The Origin of Species, which is much more engaged than what he had been doing before then. So, so I think that, but I think, it, I, I don't think he was just going, it wasn't one of those books that was going to last forever. Um, scholars do that, of course, but I don't think Darwin was really like that. I think he, he was trying to get it finished, but it would have taken quite a number more years. And I think it, it wouldn't have had the same impact at all, because I think it just wouldn't have reached that double audience that The Origin of Species does so effectively of, of more general leaders, but also people who are more specialist scientific ones. Thank you, thank you. Jim, there is, a, there is already a question in the chat, if you can take a look. Yeah, yeah I've got that. Oh, yes. um, yeah, what do I think was the biggest factor in the huge selling success of the origin of species? Well, I think when it first, one thing to stress is that I think until the 18, really until the 1870s, the book sold pretty well, but I don't think it sold fantastically well. Um, it, it really, um, you know, the numbers are, are good, but they're, you know, they're being, it's being printed, you know, every few years and an addition of a thousand, two thousand and so forth. It starts picking up in the 1880s and 90s and a couple of thousand copies every year. And then, but what really does it, I think, is, is the way in which it becomes so cheap in the early 20th century. Um, and then it becomes something that's available to everyone. And I think a lot of it was that um, the book gained a kind of reputation as being a crucial book to know about. I think people just, the reputation, it, it was, it was this, almost a symbolic sort of book that you, um, you might not read all of the book yourself. It was quite, it was, it's quite a tough read actually. It's, my, my view always has been that it's just readable enough to make it so that you can read it, but it's just technical enough so it doesn't look like it's a pot boiler. And that of course is based partly on my work on the vestiges of the natural history of creation, which was 15 years before the origin of species. And that was really readable, but a lot of people thought it was too readable. It read like a novel. And so you don't want that, you, you've got to make, so I think there's a kind of the dullness of parts of the origin are in its favor. If the whole thing had been written like the last paragraph that everyone quotes, I don't think it would have been a success. I think it's the fact that some parts are quite difficult and you really have to read line by line and work through it as a problem. That's, that, that kind of gives it credibility. So it's a very interesting amalgam of different styles that show these different audiences. Thank you, Jim. Um, maybe I just have another question now that you are uh, talking about readability. Uh, if you compare uh, Wallace's books, for example, Darwinism with the Origin of Species, what do you think, at least in my opinion, Darwinism uh, is a much uh, more readable book than the Origin of Species? But I don't know, what's your opinion in that sense? I think Wallace is. I mean, Wallace writes in a more accessible way. There's just no question about it to my mind. Um, I think he, um, I, I think there are a lot of, I mean, it's quite a complicated story, of course. I think it, Wallace didn't have the same sort of reputation as Darwin did among the scientific community. And there were things that made it, so he made it difficult for himself. If he had just published his book on geographical distribution and not his things on, you know, flat earth deniers or the, this, you know, the spiritualism and so forth, it would have been a different question. And I think that that's partly where Wallace suffered by having, Wallace was a very open kind of thinker in many ways. And Darwin is much more rigorous and specific in terms of the way he handles questions. Um, and I think that's, I mean, if you look at the reception of Darwin in like places like China or, um, or the way that um, Mar al Shakri has talked about it in the Arabic world, it isn't Darwin that they're directly reading mostly there. The translations occur quite late. They're reading Huxley, Spencer, to some extent Wallace. You know, they're reading these people who are able to reach these broader issues and conclusions. And Darwin is always the one who's the, 
he's the kind of expert who bottoms out the whole thing within the scientific world and bridging that gap between the, the knowing the having specialist research come out of it, but then also the bigger speculations. And it's that kind of thing that makes Darwin's work so powerful for many people. Um, and then I think it's something that also, um, and that, that's why, for example, the origin sells pretty well, but it doesn't sell that well. And the numbers of trans most of the translations that are published, other than the ones in French and German, are mainly, I think, almost for many places, symbolic. I mean, it matters more. I mean, in Mexico, for example, most people read the French translation for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and the Spanish translation was really for a symbol that there was a revolutionary radicalism within the Spanish world at the time when it was first issued. And the same thing for some of the other um, translations as well, like the Russian translation. So, so it's, it's got a very, there's an interesting relationship between the distribution of evolution and the distribution of the origin and what it means. Thank you. Thank you very much much for your for your answer. Tenemos alguna otra pregunta en YouTube, de casualidad? No more questions. Okay, there are no more questions. Uh, Ana, no sé si quieres uh, comentar okay. algo. Despide, despide al, al profesor en inglés si quieres y yo cierro en español. Okay, uh, thank you very much again for this wonderful lecture, uh, Jean. We're really honored and pleased with, uh, with your beautiful presence in this case. And we wish that maybe soon that you can came to Mexico, it will be a, a great honor for us. And uh, uh, Professor Barone is going to close for the session. Yes, thank you, Professor, again, and looking forward to, to see you uh, soon next year. We are we are in plans with Luz Fernanda to, to uh, for the opportunity to have you here next year. Yeah, I hope that works out. I'd really like that. So yes. anyway, yes. thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it is a great honor. And um, oh, it's for us. Thank you very much. Eh, agradecemos a todos su presencia eh, a esta conferencia del Dr. Eh, James Eckhart, eh, el Seminario Universitario de Historia, Filosofía y Estudios de las Ciencias y la Medicina les da la más, este, eh, les agradece su participación y los invitamos cordialmente a la última eh, conferencia de esta serie que será el día de mañana a la misma hora en el mismo canal y le impartirá el doctor Antonio Lascano Araujo de la Facultad de Ciencias. <risa>